level of policing in our community. Coronavirus has really added new complications to our current system and allows us to reimagine it in two totally different ways. Unfortunately, one of the ways is veering towards authoritarianism and total surveillance. And it's gonna take all of us as citizens and as activists to really pay attention to what is going on and knowing how to defend ourselves and how to fight a system of policing that will take away um, our civil liberties. So an, an enormous part, I just wanna acknowledge an enormous part of this equation is incarceration and what happens in our jails and prisons. That is not gonna be the focus of today's uh, episode. Today we are going to be focused on um, civil, civil liberties and protecting them. So to, to this conversation, we've invited uh, Savitri D, a great activist and um, artist, and Dave Rankin, a civil rights lawyer. And I'm going to allow them to both introduce themselves. And of course, as ever, we have Andrew Epstein here, um, who will moderate our Q&A. So before we get to the introductions, I forgot to mention that um, we will have the second half of this be a Q&A from the audience. And um, you can ask your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can tweet at us at M4Assembly, or you can leave a note on our Facebook page and members of our team are monitoring those. Uh, so the first half will be a conversation between us and the second half will be a conversation between our guests and you. Uh, and that will be moderated by Andrew. So um, let's hear from Savitri first and then Dave. Hi, uh, thank you so much um, for inviting me today. Um, it's good to be in any conversation uh, right now, as you all know. Um, my name is Savitri D and I'm an activist and an artist based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, for about 20 years, I've been working in New York City uh, broadly resisting uh, consumerism, gentrification, militarization, and of course that work has always taken place largely in public space. So uh, my interest and my passion is about expanding public space, uh, resisting privatization there, and protecting all of us in those spheres. Uh, and that includes, I should just say, non-citizens. Uh, these laws should protect everybody, not just the uh, those given the, the right paperwork. Um, <laughs> and uh, we know how this plays out in New York, largely on racial lines, and that's hugely problematic. Um, and I know it's good to divide the, uh, the, con the conversation about the public sphere and what happens inside the jails and incarceration, but of course they're deeply intertwined and connected. And uh, we can never stop thinking about the repercussions and how uneven they are. In, in these conversations. Absolutely. Thank you, and thanks for coming. Yeah, uh, my Dave? pleasure. Um, hi, Emily, thanks a bunch for having, for having me. Um, Dave Rankin, I'm a civil rights attorney uh, partner at Bill Doc Levine Hoffman. Personally, I've been working on policing issues for about 15 years, starting with the Republican National Convention, the over-policing there, then the over-policing of critical mass, then the Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter and you know many of the other um, larger social movements that have larger and smaller social movements that have been <laughs> around our city over the last 15 years. Um, a lot of my work has been concentrated on bringing civil rights actions for the over policing around those events. Um, the majority of my day to day is sort of really the civil rights actions related to jails and prisons and just policing generally not related to the First Amendment, but certainly a large section of that has been First Amendment related work. Um, I'm lucky to be at the office that did uh, Eric Gardner, Central Park Five, Floyd, um, Stop and Frisk. So this is <laughs> what I've been up to for a little bit and you know, happy to, to chat about this. Great, thank you. So let's start by getting into what are the rights that citizens have um, as as is written so you want to tell us a little bit dave about uh the fourth amendment and and the rights that are guaranteed uh to citizens at status quo sure uh the fourth amendment is a you know supposed to be a pretty powerful thing which you know the text says there should be no unreasonable search or seizures 
that's been interpreted to mean that people should not be arrested without probable cause. And what probable cause means is a well-founded belief that someone has committed a crime. I mean, not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but a real well-founded belief that every element of a crime listed, someone has done. And as it sits right now, that that's required. Uh, there's many protections, you know, arguably anyway, um, that you need, the police need to see you doing something illegal in order, or have uh -huh. reason to believe that you've done something illegal before they can stop you. So that's kind of where it is now. One of the things that I think is, you know, as this conversation progresses, this is one of the ways that police have been getting around the Fourth Amendment is public-private partnerships, because there's no, you don't have Fourth Amendment protections from corporations, right? If a corporation gives your um, metadata to the government, you know, the corporation's violating your rights, not the government. The Fourth Amendment only applies to public, you know, to the government. Um, so that's where things sit at the moment. Uh, the, I mean, this is a health emergency, right? I mean, we're all doing this from inside our house. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's good reason, with good and, you know, productive reasons. Uh, that said, the tools with which the government has decided to get us here, you know, I think are more expansive than necessary um, and potentially run into some very dangerous territory. The, as it sits right, that was the kind of the Fourth Amendment analysis. As it, um, with, as it relates to the First Amendment, the government is very, the power of the government to restrict public gatherings should be very circumscribed and very limited. Um, and to the extent that any laws or regulations infringe upon the First Amendment, it is supposed to be that those laws or regulations are interpreted in the smallest possible way. Uh, and, you know, we don't know if that's going to happen here. Um, I mean, we haven't seen any tests of it. And um, as it sits right now, um, the governor's public health law, you know, arguably, I mean, it says violates, it says it requires the cancellation of all non-essential gatherings, period. <laughs> like, uh, you know, like, um, I mean, like, that's not a nuanced phrase. Um, you know, I mean, I think we all realize that <laughs> there's good, very good reasons we're all here. Um, however, we need to be very careful about how we, we get here. I agree. I think uh, just looking back, uh, you know, to times in New York when we've had these sorts of um, restrictive uh, measures, um, maybe not even laws, and I would say that, you know, it's just as important to discuss how we, how we self-police, right? The laws we put on each other, uh, this is really where we should start this conversation, right? And it's where in a public health crisis, we look around, we see what are people actually doing? You know, what is the actual danger? You know, and if, if they're going to use laws and, and uh, our public health laws to, to create essentially a threat so that some, so that the people on the first, furthest edge of the bell curve will take it seriously, well, then there's something wrong with our society, right? Like, I should be able to go over to my neighbor and say, hey, man, listen, this is important, you know? Homo shouldn't have to put a law down. So why is he putting that law there? You know, if for, for activists like us, it, it seems clear that those laws expand their, their right to do whatever they want and, and to uh, push back against any gains we have made uh, to protect our public spaces and our personal rights. Uh, we saw that after 9-11, it took everything we had to get back the First Amendment after 9-11. Mm -hmm. and, and Dave can tell you this, the, the RNC in 2004 was like a, a battle for our First Amendment in this city. And that had everything to do with what happened at 9-11 and the way that we, re we retracted our rights and our, our, not just our ability to go get them, but also the way we looked at each other, the way we said to each other, no, no, don't do that, don't do that, or the way we sentimentalized you know, law and order. So it's really important in times like this to, to rigorously pursue uh, your rights more than ever, right? And, and particularly because the vulnerable are more vulnerable in crises, right? So people like me, white ladies like me who live in Brooklyn and are not subject to search and seizure and are basically have, you know, 
can do whatever we want. We need to do those things as, you know, obviously safety considered first, but um, yeah, back to Dave, I guess. Right. It's on, it's on us to really push this issue because we have social privilege as, as white women in the community. Well, I mean, it's not just that we all have to do it. We all yeah. have to, you know, the first amendment myself, I'm not a property owner. Okay. The first amendment is my law. That's what I have. It's what gets me at the table. It's what makes me a stakeholder in almost every struggle I've ever been involved with. The only thing that gets me at that table is the first amendment. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not a property owner. I don't have an economic stake in these in these fights usually. So, uh, you know, a lot of these laws, as far as I can tell, and I'm no lawyer, you know, they're re really written around property and around the rights of property. And uh, so there are a few of them that are not about property. And the First Amendment mm -hmm. is the main one. <laughs> so you notice there's all those things are down there in the First Amendment, you know, assembly, religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, you know, um, I need those things. That's all I have, right, in this country, in this legal system, largely. So um, I, I, I can't say enough that in my experience in New York City, it's moments like this when we have to be ever more vigilant and rigorous about defending those rights. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is useful to note in uh, Judge Cuomo, or in uh, Andrew Cuomo's <laughs> order is this is a misdemeanor, right? If you are violating um, the this order and you have a celebration, a meeting, or something that's deemed non-essential, you're subject to up to a year in prison. Yeah. I mean, wow. that's bonkers. Like, it could be something where you get a fine, maybe that makes some sense, or some type of, you know, remedial something. But the idea that this is an, um, a misdemeanor, really, without any guidance, I mean, this is just, I mean, the law just says, otherwise restricts public and private businesses, places of public accommodation, and cancellation of non-essential non gatherings of individuals of any size for any reason. <laughs> what? Wow. I mean, that that could be me and my wife going to the grocery store, right? I mean, like that's, um, which leads to the issue is that's never going to be me and my wife going to the grocery store, right? right? I mean, who's going to be actually affected by this as with all? almost every tool given to law enforcement, it's going to be used against the most vulnerable population. Um, right. And while I think we can all agree that, you know, social distancing and doing this is something with, that we should be doing, as Sav to Savitri's point, that needs to be a community-led situation for the good of our populace rather than a, we're going to incarcerate you <laughs> if you don't keep six feet away from somebody in a line. Well, I mean, I heard de Blasio yesterday saying, you know, basically, if you see something, say something writ large. He actually was, he was telling people to call the cops on other people. And I was, I was, a, I mean, hearing that come out of his mouth, I thought, what, are you crazy? I'm supposed to call the cops on my neighbor if they're not social distancing? I mean, he really said that. So, yeah, I, I, this I mean, is I an overstep. Think, right. I mean, you know, the police arguably have a role in our society and that role is a role of force, right? I mean, police take people in an ideal world who have committed some type of very socially unacceptable act and force them into a cage, right? I mean, that's what police do in our society. That is violent, that is dangerous. Um, so it's not a situation where this is risk-free, right? I mean, calling the cops on your neighbors, who knows what that happens, right? When, you know, any, you know, hopefully we have maybe not good relationships with our neighbors, but could you at least say, hey, look, you know, what are you doing? Um, and, and go at it that way, as opposed to trying to use the force arm of the state to, you know, enforce what should be social norms. Right. So, so one of the places that we can go to protect our rights is by not calling the cops and by just going to our community members and, and talking to them directly. What are other things that we can do right now as this is going forward to make sure that we're not gonna lose our rights to public gathering and to protest and everything. Is there anything that we can- I mean, get you elected to office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's number one right now. I mean, seriously though, I, because all of these, and I don't, I mean, well, I certainly believe that, um, but these executive orders um, can be modified by the, um, by the legislature. Right. Mm -hmm. And so 
of having you know other branches of government push back against Cuomo is an incredibly important thing. This law is not written with any nuance um, at all. And having other branches of the government being like, really, uh, you really want to write that in the room having that conversation is, is exceedingly important. Right. And I think it's especially important that after, <clears throat> excuse me, after any crisis that uh, we are super aware of what gets taken out and what stays in, right? We saw that after 9-11 also, right? We saw laws that just lingered in our, in our federal system. We still have them, you know? Uh, the Patriot Act is full of things that should have gone away instantly, right? Should never have been impl implemented at all, but really should be gone now. Uh, so we just have to do the work when the when the time comes. I mean, right now, that's a hard question, Emily. You know, what can we do right now? This is a question raging in, in activist communities all over the city. What can we do? How can we act? You know, right. um, can we take action? Is Are there actions to be had? You know, you see all over the city autonomous actions with uh, banners and signs, positive and negative, hanging out windows on, uh, you know, on the sidewalk. Uh, you know, you see the firemen going to the Elmhurst Hospital and holding up signs for the nurses. I mean, those are actions, right? Those are actions in the public sphere. So, uh, you know, Reverend Billy went on Sunday uh, to the Samaritan's Purse Hospital in Central Park with the rainbow flag, you know, a famously anti-LGBTQ uh, organization uh, was arrested. Um, right. You know, we start to test and push against that envelope as soon as we can safely, right? We don't want to endanger other people. We obviously don't want to endanger ourselves, but we take the risks we can take, I think. And, um, you know, this is a difficult time to have this conversation and, and make decisions about right. action. None of us know. So you're asking the question and the, and the question just floats in the air. We don't know. And any action we do take is largely autonomous in the public sphere right, must be autonomous. Um, as far as like internet activism, there's a, a lot of amazing and interesting internet activism going on all over the world. You know, in Hong Kong, they have this amazing game that they're playing with each other. I think it was just pulled by the Chinese government. Um, there's all kinds of ways to uh, highlight these problems during the quarantine. But uh, right now, I think we're right at the edge of this question of how to go back into public space in a political radical way. Right. And make sure that those lines are not drawn, uh, you know, in, in a racist way, in a, that, that, that those laws aren't enforced, enforced in a racist way, which we know they are already. Of course, we know all this uh, is going to happen. So we have work to do answering that question. Mm -hmm. So we've got about five, five more minutes. So should we talk about um, any of the, the details of any Anything that you want to talk about in the last five minutes here? Um, I think, go ahead, Tim. Sorry. <laughs> go for it, Tavitri. No, 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 go, please. One of the, I mean, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, I think that the idea that you are criminalizing this conduct is completely unnecessary, right? Cuomo's right. been saying that the, that if you're violating social distancing and these, and these regulations, you'll be subject to a thousand dollar fine. That could be done civilly. There's, that's I mean, that, there's no reason that that's not a civil penalty. The idea that reflexively the executive branch of the, of the government decided that what they should do is make it a misdemeanor is really deeply problematic. Um, I mean, there's just nothing stopping it from being a fine. Right. Um, or being on anything, you know, but they're like, oh, no, it'll be a misdemeanor, that'll be fine, I think speaks to a really deep-seated problem in our government where any problem that we have socially needs to be met with police and cages when mm -hmm. there's just no need for that, especially mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's reflexive. It's, 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 a, it's the, the flexing of a muscle that's already way too strong, mm -hmm. you know, and we know better. And you know it's really on us to push back. Um, I think it's also, uh, you know, it's it's a terrible situation for police. Now I'm no friends of the police, but like, what position does it put them in? Also, you know, and how does a cop observe protocol in an arrest? Right? How does a cop even directly address, uh, you know, a situation like this without breaking the protocol? You know, Billy was arrested. Uh, my collaborator and partner on Sunday. 
And he was trying to maintain six feet. He had a little wand that was six feet long. And he was saying, officer, look, six feet, six feet, six feet. No, I mean, no reason to arrest. First of all, went right through that six feet. Uh, he was in the tombs. There was no observation of protocols in the tombs. He had a mask. The mask was taken from him. And they told him it's a suicide risk. They said, those little, those little elastics, that's a suicide risk. The prisoners in the tombs, no one had uh, masks. The cops were fairly well protected, uh, but the tombs were filthy. The jails were filthy. Uh, you know, I don't know where the unions are on this, but like, you know, it's not just for, you know, police are not protecting themselves either, you know. So at the very least, in their own self-interest, they could do a lot better. But I, I just, I feel like it puts everyone in a terrible situation that this is criminalized to this degree. And you just can't help but wonder if it's about expanding space for their enforcement later. You know, I don't, it makes right. you paranoid. A law like this just makes everyone paranoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so um, we're gonna switch to audience questions. So we've got Andrew here. Hello. Um, yeah, just a, just a reminder, uh, if you want to ask questions of our panelists, there's a couple ways to do that. Um, you can, if you're in the Zoom call, there's a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can tag us on Twitter at em4assembly, uh, em4assembly uh, on Twitter or email field at emily assemblycom uh, And before we move to audience questions, I just wanted to ask you both as longtime activists and organizers and advocates um, around these particular issues. Prior to this pandemic, this crisis, but what was your general kind of broad sweep view of where these kind of conversations and policies were heading in, in New York City? Um, you know, we've had three, it, especially in the past three mayoral administrations, from Giuliani to Bloomberg to de Blasio, um, what has changed and what hasn't? And were you generally feeling um, prior to this outbreak that questions of police accountability and the rights to free expression were um, heading in the right direction or the wrong direction before we hit this moment? Um, you want to take that first, David? Mm -hmm. no, it's okay. a big what question. Uh, well, I mean, the elephant in the room is the corporation, right? I mean, you know, when Dave talked earlier about the public-private problem, you know, really, you know, you have to ask who the police work for in New York City. Uh, it's it's never the free express expression of its citizens. Let me tell you, it's 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 either the state or the corporation. So we're carving out space somehow in between those two whenever we can. Um, has it been better under De Blasio? I mean. It's mushier. I don't know if it's better. It's mushier. It feels softer, but it's not really better. Um, I wouldn't say that we have expanded rights. You know, the arrests feel a little bit different. Uh, things are a little bit different in the tombs. You know, the jails aren't as cold, but uh, is it? No, it's the same. It's the same. We don't have very much public space. We fight for every inch of it. And corporations and real estate control our public spaces. Uh, you know, there's always more of these quasi private public spaces and 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 we have to test it all of it over and over and over again so uh, while on the surface I would say de Blasio you know uh, has made things a little softer and around certain issues I would say it's very different around immigration uh, the police act very differently than they do around gentrification right these fall on racial lines a lot of the time um, you know the NYPD is as racist as ever their enforcement is as discretionary as ever uh, they are pushing brown and black people around all day long, and they are, I mean, no, we're losing. Mm -hmm. We're losing ground all the time. David, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, there's not been significant pushback on the, on the NYPD. I mean, just moving it from, I think you have to look at where we kind of started this conversation, right? I mean, if you're talking about Giuliani and Bloomberg, those are uh, mayors that did that either supported or did absolutely nothing in relation to the police department. Um, so any movement by de Blasio in a direction which, you know, decreases police power is significant, but certainly not enough, right? I mean, the Floyd remedial process and kind of talking about how people are getting stopped. I mean, there, there, there is significant improvement at different levels of the police department. Um, and there's significant efforts to make 
public policing interactions better that we would have never seen out of Giuliani um, or Bloomberg from the de Blasio administration. How that plays out on the ground is a very different question, right? Um, so I think I think the way Savitri put it is that it's mushier. I mean, as, as it relates to activist arrest, we're not seeing the wholesale sweeping up of, you know, hundreds of people on the streets that we were seeing under right. Bloomberg. So yay. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, a lot of the arrests that we see and um, some of the and some of the actions are more violent, you know. Yes. Uh, so it's not better. I don't know. There's fewer of them. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, I would say, David, that they don't know who they are. The NYPD have a, a basic confusion about who they are right now, which ultimately makes them to me more dangerous because, you know, th they sometimes are not reactive at all and then they overreact. And right. it's a little bit like having a toddler around. It's it's scarier in a way than it was when we knew they were just going to kettle us all and that you know the fencing was going to come up and we were going to get pushed against that wall now they're just grabbing people and it, i don't know it's it's it does it's seem confusing a lot it's confusing yeah, no, I, I, I agree um the you know i think we're also seeing the people are tending to not be held as long i mean um a lot more desk appearance tickets and summonses after someone gets taken off the streets Whereas it used to be much more of the protocol to hold everybody for 24 hours. Um, so the impact of the activist arrest on the activists is lower, I think. I mean, just in terms of, you know, <laughs> the actual hours in custody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I think that in some ways that's the result of a avalanche of litigation related to these bad arrests. <laughs> um, thank you, Dave. <laughs> yeah, of, of which I like to consider myself a little part. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Uh, but you know, because it's expensive to do bad policing, um, or should be. Uh, yeah. Do you anticipate, we were talking about this a little bit before the Zoom call, and, and there's a sort of related question on this. Um, let's say when we emerge from this, uh, one of the new protocols in the city here and around the country is uh, temperature checks at public places, movie theaters, sporting events, maybe even at the MTA, right? As they try to you know, identify and weed out people who are sick so they can restart parts of the economy. Uh, what, I, I don't know, is, do you anticipate that being an entirely new area of law or falling under some of the same legal battles and principles that shape the stop and frisk um, fights in New York City, right? And I, I, know, I know it's a bit of a speculative question um, and they're very different things. There are genuine public health concerns around coronavirus in a way that there was never any actual justification for the mass stop and frisk program besides racist policing. Um, but how do you anticipate that going forward or, or, or the legal battles that might come out of that? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a seizure, right? Anytime someone's being seized, there has to be a reason for it. Um, and that reason needs to be found somewhere. As it relates to public space, um, private spaces, right? The MTA is actually considered a private space for um, legal purposes, which is why you have those, um, and an optional space, which is why you, which is one of the reasons that it was found to be constitutional to have those bag searches that you see going into the, into the subway. Um, going into a sporting event, that's private. They can do whatever they want. Um, the constitution doesn't apply. Uh, unless it's the, unless there's some type of partnership that can get you there. So, do I think that for large public gatherings in private spaces that they would have these restrictions? Sure. And I don't think there's much anyone can do about that, um, at least as it relates to the Constitution. That's, then it becomes on savagery's end where it's like you can shame them into doing something and you can, you know, put pressure on them to make this not happen or happen in a reasonable way, but the law is not a remedy for you. Um, the, the idea that you would have wholesale seizures as it relates to a public health concern would be deeply problematic. Um, I mean, like if the idea that you would not be allowed into a park um, unless you got your temperature taken, I, that just sounds to me to be like just massively unconstitutional. Um, subway, mm, maybe not. Uh, concert, absolutely. You know, so it's like, it's gonna be that kind of spectrum. Um, and one would assume that, you know, anyone that would be implementing this kind of thing would understand what that spectrum looks like and 
you know, presumably started at the end that they know they're untouchable and have it creep, you know, creep forward. And also, I'd it? say right. again, it's it's a good it's a good thing to remember too. Uh, you know, what kind of propaganda that is, right? What is that story for? What is that temperature checking for? And who is it really for, right? Uh, is it for like to make everyone feel better? Is that really what it's about? Is it about calming people down? We know with China, part of the storytelling there was for the rest of the world. Like, look, we have it under control. It's fine. We've got this, you know? So there's a, there's a, a storytelling element there. And I think, again, I would turn back to the community, right? And say like, what is it that we need from this? What is the assurance the government is tr assuming they, that we need uh, to get from them in order to feel safe in our communities? So, uh, you know, this is about people keeping people safe, right? <laughs> this is about us keeping each other safe. And we have to do a lot better at that. We have to do a lot better at uh, taking the time to do that and not... Uh, Knowing our neighbors, knowing our communities, uh, you know, having networks in place. This is where mutual aid and community support are so critical and important because we can turn to government and say, we got this, we're good. We don't need you doing that. This is us doing that. But if we're not doing that, then there's a lot of people in our society who want the government to do that. And that's where I think the tension really lies and, and where we have to do work on our end. Mm -hmm. We have a question here uh, from somebody who first wants to shout out uh, their lawyer and comrade, Dave Rankin, uh, perhaps a client. Um, how crucial are cop watchers like myself, this is a question, during the pandemic when it comes to documenting police interactions with the community? What advice do you have around that? Well, I mean, I think, I think cop watchers are great just kind of generally. You know, I mean, the idea that there's a formalized system to understand that that had the police understand that the community is observing what they're doing and there will be a record of that interaction is just tremendous, right? I mean, the idea that because 99 times out of 100, it's just the police officer's word versus somebody else's word mm -hmm. um, or some, you know, really distorted body cam footage. And to have some third party record that interaction, you know, keeps everybody honest, right? Uh, and you know the idea that if, if they are going to be stopping people for um you know violating this public order keeping it true what was actually happening right you can say oh, well, look they were there sure they left the minute you told them to that's a very different thing than just the police officer running up to somebody having somebody you know say something potentially not pleasant back to them and then getting having that person get arrested right um, if, it, if the, without a cop watcher, all that looks like is somebody saying something unpleasant and, uh, and getting arrested. Um, so no, it's, it's, a, it's crucially important and it's crucially important that the police understand that the communities do have recording devices, are recording, understand how to use those recordings. Um, because I think that just that threat really, I mean, it, it modifies police behavior and that's really what we're looking for. I agree. And I think it's really important, too, that uh, cop watchers understand what escalation and de-escalation are and that there's language that can be used very quickly and simply that that escalates and de-escalates those situations. And always to know that in that in that situation, someone's being hurt by the police. Right. And that there's a uh, you know, there's a human element to it. Right. Like I'm with you. I support you. You know, I'm watching. You know, a lot of times I see people just take out their video and start shooting with their cameras, you know, and uh, you know, that's no accident that we're shooting with our cameras, right? So humanize it. I would encourage people to always humanize the, the witnessing um, as much as you can, which can de-escalate things with the police as well, swiftly. We have a question uh, about um, the wearing of masks, uh, which has now become, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, yeah. suggested ambiguously suggested by the president, but generally suggested by public health officials. Um, obviously, for people who've been involved in uh, activists, certain kinds of activists, direct action, uh, the wearing of a mask is a different thing, and it's something that has been um, policed or criminalized in various parts of the country before. Um, this isn't a necessarily specific question. It's more just about how you see that playing out. I mean, what's going to change now that people are being literally encouraged to wear masks. And, and I'll add to that, there was a story in the Washington Post 
yesterday about, of course, uh, people of color uh, wearing masks following the guidelines being policed just like they were before this crisis uh, in public shopping areas and places. Um, but, you know, just for me personally, it's a funny experience to walk into the bank or the bodega with a bandana around my, my face. It's not something yeah. I thought I would be doing. Yeah. yeah a, lot, a lot easier for me you. to do it. Right? Um, it's illegal in New York. Um, I mean, it's really, and it has been for about 150 years to have more yeah. than three people wearing a similar, you know, uh, mask. Um, you know, activists have been saying that that law has been discriminatorily enforced time immemorial. Um, or anyway, since, I, <laughs> since I've come along, they have. Uh, and the only people that I've ever seen arrested for it are, you know, black bloc folks. Um, now, when you have, you know, whole families going out in the exact same masks, they're violating the law. I mean, like, that's just, like, there is a law on the books that makes that a crime. Um, obviously, that's not being enforced because, well, it's a good idea to do that. <laughs> um, but it, again, shows the kind of the overreach of that law. Um, I mean, I think it's just going to be an equal protection challenge the next time someone gets arrested for a mask uh, for as associated with political activity, because right now it's just not being enforced. Um, and the only time I think that you're going to see it enforced is as it relates to political activity. And I think there's this, this is one of the facts that we've never had for an equal protection argument right with mm -hmm. it. I mean, all mm -hmm. we've ever been able to say is, hey, the only time I've ever seen this enforced is with First Amendment activity. Right. But then they come back and so say, well, has someone similarly situated ever been arrested, not been arrested for it? Right. And there isn't that person, but now there is. So we'll, mm -hmm. we will see if we see arrests um, with masks in the future. And if we do, um, I know a number of us on the, uh, in the civil rights bar are waiting for it. Right. And, and facial recognition works with a partial face mask. So no, no, the, the, the corporate concern is they're fine. <laughs> You're talking about the facial technology, like facial recognition yeah, yeah. surveillance technology. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah. I didn't realize that it can, it can still oh, test yeah. your face yeah. with your nose and mouth covered. Yes. Interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, there's still a few, some time if folks want to uh, ask questions in the chat box here. Um, if they want to ask them on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, and we don't have any queued up at the moment right now. Let me quickly check here. Um, can I be so bold as to ask another question myself in this, <laughs> in this moment? Because I'm not, I'm, I'm not finding anyone. This is a question for Savitri. Uh, this is one that's just coming to me now. But I, if you recall after 9-11, one of the admonitions we got from the government then was that it was part of your patriotic duty to return to buying things. Um, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but I do remember it vividly. One of the things George W. Bush said in the aftermath of 9-11 was, go out and shop. It's important. Resuscitate the economy. Um, there are, of course, small businesses right now that are struggling and will continue to struggle. Um, patronizing them um, is important for returning to some kind of community you had before. But I'm, I'm curious for your thoughts, given your activist work around anti-consumerism, the Church of Stop Shopping, your work with Rev and Billy, um, what do you, how are you thinking about that issue, um, given that the fact that the economy is kind of collapsing and, and we are going to be sort of asked in ways that are not totally unfair, go out and shop at your local store because mm -hmm. they're gonna need to survive. Okay, well, the exact quote, as I recall, was if you love your country, you'll shop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I, I would say like this is a critical moment. Um, and, uh, you know, my heart starts pounding when I think of the small businesses and the families of New York City in particular who are in free fall at this moment. Uh, the reset that is taking place in our economy is, uh, you know, we've never experienced anything like this. Uh, we have an opportunity when we come back from this to change how we build our economy. Uh, we as <clears throat> residents um, of New York, and we have a responsibility to those small businesses. We do not have a responsibility to those large corporations. And, you know, my greatest fear, and I'm sure many of you share it, is that uh, the small businesses aren't going to come back and that we're going to be left with the monoculture in New York City. And, you know, that's, of course, you know, the, the basic tenet of disaster capitalism, the shock doctrine, you know, these are, this, this is what happens historically. 
you know, corporations take advantage of this moment, they can bankroll this moment, they can wait it out, they can come back strong, and the small shops, the small businesses, the regional, the regionally built change, chains, the local chains, they can't do it. They can't wait three months. So, um, you know, I mean, I, my little hairs are standing out because I'm so worried. I'm so worried about those um, people, those families, those businesses, and the very fabric of our city, which is built on, the, on, the, on those small merchants. And I, um, you know, I'm terrified. I, and I think we all should be, and we have to be very serious now. So if you're shopping online, if you can, shop from those companies. But when we come back, boy, whew, it doesn't look good. I mean, it doesn't look good. I don't know what to say, I, and I'm trying, I, all day I sit here and think like, what can we do from our houses right now to ensure that the small shops on my street here in Windsor Terrace survive this? What can we do? You know, um, it's hard, but we, it's on us. again, we have to do something. <laughs> Thank you. We've been talking with a number of, of different sectors in the small business economy, and they're all asking us like how, can we protest and really force Cuomo and the state legislator, late legislature to really stop rent? That's the only thing that's gonna save small businesses. And, and this is getting into this question of public gathering. Like, how do we have a meaningful protest without disruption? Like, how, how are we gonna bring the disruption to another level um, where, where we're not breaking these public gathering? Um, really tough. Emily, it's really hard. I mean, even in our community, which is a very radical community, there is some pretty broad ranging uh, emotions and opinions about whether it's legitimate to call anyone to any sort of action right now. Now, you know, in Central Park, we have a good test case with the Samaritan's Purse Hospital, which sits up there in the East Meadow on public property, which it is privatized, that is run by the Alliance there, but, or the Central Park Conservancy. But uh, you know that is a, a a religious organization that is using uh, accommodations and exceptions to discriminate against uh, queer people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, incredible situation, unbelievable. Uh, so there's a fence stretching around the East Meadow Park. We've called people to put signs on that fence. You know there are people walking in the park anyway. They're riding their bike to that park. Put signs on that fence. Start saying no to that hospital. You know you're not disrupting their their medical work, you're not disrupting, uh, you know, the vent, you know, whatever procedures they're carrying out down there. Uh, and this is something you can do alone, autonomously, without endangering anyone or yourself. So, uh, you know, that's a start, um, that kind of action. Uh, certainly, it's hard right now to convince people to be disruptive when all we want to do is cooperate, right? In crisis, we want to cooperate. That's what most humans want to do. So, uh, calling Cuomo now, you know, it's like, oh, well, he's really busy. Isn't he busy trying to get ventilators to save everybody's lives? But, you know, obviously he's not picking up the phone for your call. So call him. Uh, right. All those things now, you have the time to do it, do it. And that's a start. But as far as like, uh, you know, actually organizing gatherings, I mean, we still can't. I don't think we can, Dave. I mean, I, I want to, that's all I want to do, but I, I don't think we can. I mean, that's all I want to do. But. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all, all the tools that we kind of understand ourselves to have are really, I mean, <laughs> like, yeah. You have a, a, right? I mean, you know, we can email and call, but that's, you know, do this. That's, that's really where we're at. Wear things on your clothes when you go out, right? So, mm. This is a good time for sloganeering to propaganda in every space you can. I should have a sign behind me now. I'm yeah. wasting this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am too. It should say, uh, maybe a, them all. <laughs> we have a, a, a question on this exact issue, which is the possibility of protest with people standing six feet apart. Is that something that you've thought about, Savitri? Um, yeah, and how of course. Might go about? Think about it all day, but I, I still think at this time, you know, yeah, the, the, the chance of contagion is, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think we so. Have, um, I don't know if this is outside of your legal expertise, Dave, but I'm going to put it to you. Uh, we have a question. Do you have any thoughts about voter suppression risks resulting from coronavirus changes? I'm thinking about a few different pieces. One, petition challenges at the state level, right? So those are still going forward. Candidates, especially aligned with the Brooklyn Democratic machine and Queens machine, are challenging insurgent candidates and putting BOE election workers at risk. 
And two, the news about the state budget provision allowing for the BOE to remove dropped candidates from the poll, which in turn could result in canceling the upcoming federal primary. And again, to put a little more context on that, Cuomo can, if he wants, now that Bernie Sanders has dropped out, cancel the presidential primary and not give us the opportunity to do what Bernie asked us to do the other day and still vote for him so our movement can acquire delegates for the convention. So I'll put both of these to you, Dave, if you have any thoughts on this. Not an election lawyer. <laughs> like a, uh, it, I, I can give, I can, my thoughts on this issue are really just like anybody else's, you know. Um, anytime you have concentrated executive power in a time of crisis, the danger of it being used against progressive movements is massive. For, um, there, it shows itself in many varieties. Cuomo has been very clear about how he is using. Oh, I love his hat. Yes. Um, <laughs> well done. Uh, you know, he's been very clear about how he uses that power, right? Um, I mean, he's used it his entire, you know, governorship. So it's it's dangerous, but I can only speak from it from a, a citizen's point of view, not from a legal point of view, because I just don't know. Sorry, I'm muted. Yes, um, and I see Savitri has managed to put up a very cool background. That's awesome. Um, um, yeah, it's something that we need to keep a very close eye on. I don't think there's been clarity around it yet. Um, how the election system plays out is huge. I mean, it can it can make or break our chances of uh, ballot democracy in, in June. Um, absolutely. Well, that's all the questions we have, as far as I can tell. If I, I'll give folks another chance right now if they, if they have any last questions for our panelists to drop into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you're in Zoom or tag us at EM number four assembly at Twitter. Um, while I'm waiting to see if there are any um, other questions from audience, are there any other things you two would like to plug or mention before we bring this to a close? I mean, I would just always return people to the question of enforcement <clears throat> and discretionary enforcement in our city and just to be super aware of how that plays out here. And uh, this is your problem, even if it isn't your problem, right? All these questions are your problem, even if they aren't your problem. So, uh, you know, we are dealing with a racist police force and uh, they enforce with discrimination. And so, uh, we have to all take that seriously and take it on ourselves to work against it. I would like to amplify what Savitri just said. And anytime you give the executive branch more power and more laws to enforce, that law, those laws are enforced uniformly against the underclass and people on the margins. Um, and I don't think we've ever seen it not be the case. And we need to come up with more creative solutions to solving what is obviously a very serious and pressing problem rather than just making something criminalized. I think we have one more question, possibly. Yeah, we do. Um, again, I don't know if this is an area of law that you know well, uh, Dave, but um, now that man there are mandatory meetings, things like uh, community boards meetings, which are sort of mandated by, uh, I don't know what level of law, whether it's borough or city or state, but, um, but uh, now that those meetings are not happening because a lot of community boards have not been able to figure out the technology for them, is that a violation of public meeting law? Do you have any sense of that? I was actually, I've been actually been wondering about the public meeting laws. Um, I do a lot of uh, freedom of information law work and public meeting law work. Um, to the extent that these meetings do become moved online, right? Um, I don't, I can't speak to whether or not they need to happen and what happens when they don't happen. But to the extent all of these meetings do move online, um, public access to them is a real issue. Also, same is true with court proceedings. Um, mm -hmm. The New York state courts are really trying to, and federal courts are really trying to all move either online or in a privatized way, which makes total sense because, right? I mean, we're not supposed to leave our house. Um, but we have very robust protections um, from the First Amendment uh, into and from the open meeting laws in how everyone should have access to that. Uh, and I don't see provisions in the court system. I don't see provisions in the you know mm. meeting laws 
which are allowing that to happen. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think everyone right now is so focused on how do we do the necessary thing in front of us, right? I mean, I have <laughs> dozens of court appearances I didn't go to because, you know, I'm here. Uh, but all of those court appearances would have been open to the public, but for this, right? Um, you know, the, the argument lines, right? These are arguments that would happen in open court every day of the week. Would someone be there? Maybe, maybe not, but they could be because that door is open, right? right. I get a call-in number for one of my arguments. Yeah, you know. also we know, from, we know from the immigration courts that when, when the uh, arraignments and when the hearing, the bond hearings move to video, the odds go down tremendously for the, uh, the person in that hearing. So the, the, oh, yeah. the same discrimination plays out times 10 on video. Uh, you know, racial it's discrimination. It's so much easier to, to dehumanize to be human over a video yeah. than it is if you're actually looking at them. I mean, so let's be sure that we go back to regular hearings when after we're done with this video time. You know, I know Billy was arraigned on Monday uh, via Skype. And interestingly, they were not able to figure out how, how he and his lawyer could have a private conversation. So mm -hmm. they had to have their conversation in front of the judge and the DA, a hugely problematic. Okay, they had to discuss the deal in front of them. So, okay, come on, yeah, it's not that's, working. That's not working. That's not working. Really not constitutional. <laughs> there. Like a, yeah, like, come on. Like massively, like and not. Yeah, really problematic. No. Well, um, this is a fantastic discussion. I'm really glad you were both able to join us. And I think that it's shown us that there's a lot of open opportunity for our, so our society to be reshaped. And it's up to us which way it gets reshaped. And uh, I invite those of you who are watching this uh, to reach out to us or to reach out to uh, Savitra or Dave um, if you want to connect about uh, these issues that we've been discussing, we're looking for new ways to protest, to um, protect our, our public rights, and to protect our civil liberties. And this is something, as Dave mentioned before, that has so much to, to be negotiated at the state government level. And this is why we are talking about this here. It is really important for us to understand the breadth of what the state government legislature can do. And a lot of it is a check on Cuomo. And I know people are really into loving Cuomo right now, but this is a dangerous time for us. And we really need to be making sure that we have advocates up there who are thinking about our society and not just about personal power. So Thank you. I urge you, send us your ideas for town halls, send us your questions, we can connect you. Um, do the guests wanna talk about how they would like people to connect with them if they have any questions or concerns? Uh, you can always find us at revbilly.com and uh, thank you, Emily, so much and best of luck with your campaign. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry it's taking place in these confusing times and <laughs> good luck. Thank you for thank having you. me today. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Dave. Yeah, nice and thank you, me. Andrew, for your moderating today. My pleasure. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, really Dave, do you want to give any, any wrap up about... Uh, I, can, I can be reached if uh, Google uh, David Rankins, um, Bellbach, Levine, Hoffman. Pretty, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, and Emily, best of luck. Uh, I hope, um, hope you all the best. Wish you all the best, and we're really um, excited about your campaign and yeah. way to way to struggle through this uh, yeah. through, through this moment. And shout out to uh, Dave Rankin. I think we're, my sister was arrested at the RNC in 2004 and was part of the class action lawsuit. And uh, <laughs> oh shout God. out to you for your work on all of that. She spent oh three my days God. At, at the pier on the west side. The, the, he like, was like uh, 12 years old. Dave was like 12 years old then. <laughs> <laughs> I think my sister was 18 when that happened, or 17, yeah. but she spent three oh days God. at the pier. Um, but oh thank you God. for your work on that to a, a grateful family for advocating for our sister. So. Uh, thanks all so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.